Protective housing, the chance to make friends, and a private garden. The Golden State Killer's life in prison is unexpected, to say the least. The so-called Golden State Killer, also known as the East Area Rapist, terrorized California throughout the 1970s and 80s. By the time the notorious serial killer was caught in 2018, he was 72 years old. Joseph James D'Angelo Jr., a former police officer, confessed to the crimes he'd been connected to with DNA, ultimately pleading guilty to 13 murders and 13 kidnappings. Investigators say that DNA was then plugged into the genealogy website. If the statute of limitations hadn't expired, there would have been another 42 rapes, along with 161 additional counts of crimes like robbery, burglary, and attempted murder for the Los Angeles Times. Despite his extensive crimes, D'Angelo didn't face the death penalty. Of this decision, Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer said via the Los Angeles Times, What's so frustrating is that if anyone is the poster child for the death penalty, it's D'Angelo. Instead, D'Angelo was handed consecutive life sentences without parole. According to NBC News, the death penalty had been taken off the table in exchange for D'Angelo's confession. Prosecutors noted that getting D'Angelo to admit to the crimes was incredibly important, especially for survivors and family members of the victims. D'Angelo's age was also a consideration when it came to the death penalty. Given that D'Angelo was 74 years old at trial and it could take a whopping 30 to 35 years to go from trial to execution, it was likely he would die from old age on death row. Instead, it was decided that what life he had left would be spent behind bars and families would get some much-needed closure. Neighbors seemed shocked when Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. was arrested at his home in April 2018. According to ABC News, he was taken into custody while law enforcement searched his house, looking for some of the items stolen from victims over the years. Neighbors say D'Angelo was an average suburban homeowner. Shortly after his arrest, Sacramento County Sheriff Scott Jones confirmed that D'Angelo was being held at the county jail in a psychiatric ward, for CBS News. Jones also added that D'Angelo was being kept under strict supervision, as he had also been put on suicide watch. More than two years had passed when it was reported that D'Angelo had entered his guilty plea with the courts, shedding a little more light on what had been going on behind closed doors. It transpired that D'Angelo blamed his crimes on an inner voice that he named Jerry. In an interrogation room following his arrest, D'Angelo reportedly said, for CBS News, I didn't have the strength to push him out. He made me. He went with me. It was like in my head. I mean, he's a part of me. I didn't want to do those things. I pushed Jerry out and had a happy life. I did all those things. I destroyed all their lives. So now I've got to pay the price. And I'm really sorry. When 74-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. appeared in court, the elderly man was visibly frail, using a wheelchair, and reportedly seemed weak and confused. As a result, many found it hard to believe that he was accused of some of the most horrific crimes in California history. According to retired Contra Costa County District Attorney Investigator Paul Holes, D'Angelo often appeared catatonic while being questioned by police. However, according to Holes, the Golden State Killer was putting on an act. Holes explained per oxygen, Don't believe this guy that you see being wheeled into court. That's not who he is. He's the ultimate tactician, and his defense strategy is going to try and minimize what's going to happen to him. I've listened all your... Holes also went on to describe D'Angelo as fit and active, something the killer's neighbors substantiated, SFGate reported. After his conviction, the DA's office released some of the video footage of D'Angelo in his cell. Interestingly, it shows him doing things like exercising and climbing on furniture to reach things, which is far different from the image he presented in court. When Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. was handed a sentence of life behind bars, victims and their families appealed to the courts to have him locked away in a dark, distant place. Despite being united in the request, it was ultimately up to the state's corrections department to evaluate the Golden State Killer and decide where he should be incarcerated. Factors such as his age, notoriety, medical and mental health requirements, and the need for safety all impacted the decision. However, the decision regarding which prison would house D'Angelo took some time. In particular, the COVID-19 pandemic delayed matters and meant that the murderer was initially held in Sacramento County. At the time he was sentenced, the state had put to halt all transfers in hopes of stopping the spread of the virus through prison systems. It wasn't until November 2020, approximately two and a half months after his sentencing, that D'Angelo was moved to North Kern State Prison, KCRA NBC reported. However, that wasn't his final destination, but instead a reception center responsible for holding inmates while the final housing decisions were made. Early in February 2021, it was reported that Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. had been transferred to Corcoran State Prison. He was not, however, going to be housed with the prison's general population. KALW Public Radio got a rare inside look at the prison in 2013. At the time, it was home to around 12,000 inmates, making up half of the town's 24,000-person population. D'Angelo was set to be kept in a very small section inside the larger prison, called the Protective Housing Unit. 
It was revealed that the small unit contains approximately 20 cells. The unit is specifically for those deemed too notorious to live in the general population of the prison and who might become targets, or those who have committed particularly horrifying crimes. As an example, Charles Manson spent some time there. As revealed by KALW Public Radio's 2013 visit to Corcoran State Prison, the protective housing unit where D'Angelo lives isn't easy to access. In fact, it's necessary to go through a series of gates, fences, barbed wire fences, more gates, and hallways with security cameras to reach the unit. Then, people must proceed through the security housing unit, which is where the inmates deemed too dangerous to be allowed near others are kept. The building housing the protective housing unit is next door. As reported by the Los Angeles Times, the only thing separating the two units is one remote-controlled door. The protective housing unit is completely isolated and self-sufficient, with meals sent there by the prison's kitchens. Inside the building is a room outfitted with metal furniture. The concrete cells are a standard 8x12, and each has its own private toilet and sink, along with concrete beds, lighting, and shelving units. There's also a place to plug in electrical devices, as inmates are allowed televisions and radios in their cells. When a reporter from KALW Public Radio was escorted into the protective housing unit at Corcoran State Prison, one of the first things she saw was the outside yard. This featured boxing equipment, picnic tables, and a garden where inmates could grow their own vegetables. It was also revealed that inmates were allowed to go outside a few times a day, and that they had the place to themselves. As a result, Corcoran State Prison's protective housing unit is a far cry from one of the most dangerous prisons in the world. Prisoners in the unit are seemingly allowed a lot of freedom, with the ability to come and go from their cells as they please. They're also allowed to socialize with other inmates in the unit, which is considered their home. It's also worth mentioning that not everyone believes Corcoran State Prison to be an idyllic location for all inmates. In 1996, attorney Catherine Campbell filed a wrongful death lawsuit on behalf of the relatives of an inmate who was shot and killed at Corcoran State Prison, amid accusations of officer brutality. According to SF Gage, she ultimately won the family an $825,000 settlement. Of the main prison, Campbell told the Los Angeles Times, Corcoran is a nightmare. The people who work there don't consider themselves part of the legal system that controls and constrains the rest of us. It's an outlaw fortress. Meanwhile, Campbell described the protective housing unit where Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. lives as claustrophobic, saying, I have never seen anything like it in all my years of going into prisons. You felt like you were walking into a benign mental health ward. It was not frightening. I have been more frightened by prisoners behind glass than by these prisoners. They seem so removed, so to Claude. However, conflicting accounts of Corcoran suggest that the prison isn't completely bleak. In 2005, Terry Thornton, a spokesperson for the Corrections Department, told the Los Angeles Times, it's a quiet, well-behaved yard. They rarely have any incidents. According to Prison Law Project attorney Keith Watley, inmates regularly petition to get into the unit, especially if they have been attacked in their current environment. Watley says the screening process is long and intense, with many hoping to secure a spot in the very unit D'Angelo was assigned to. In 2005, attorney Catherine Campbell told the Los Angeles Times that Corcoran's protective housing unit was filled with all kinds of characters who've been tossed together in a weird mix of shared infamy and notoriety. However, it's also worth noting that there's no real way to tell who D'Angelo is sharing his space with, as the inmate list for Corcoran State Prison's protective housing unit is a closely guarded secret. In some cases, residents are reportedly housed in the unit because they have testified against other inmates, putting a target on their backs. Others are allegedly high-ranking gang members who may have people out to get them. When a reporter from KALW Public Radio went inside the unit, she was told that the identities of prisoners are kept secret. It also isn't widespread knowledge how many inmates are being held in the unit at one time, as safety is a top priority. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.